Um, actually, this is just something I put together very quickly a week or two ago, preparing for next week's course, because I'll give a whole day next week on analyzing gaps in, in surveys. And I wanted to have one, in, one um, example from the data sets that I circulated to you all. And South Africa was too big and the gaps are going to be too small. And so it was kind of like the, the what was it, the three bears, the, the story about this bed's too hard and this bed's too soft and this one's just right. Kenya was kind of right in the middle um, as far as density of data. So I just kind of asked, remember that, that, that idea of data leakage? I just asked, well, where are the leaks? So started off just with exactly the data set you guys got, which was pulled out of the current GBIF version. And I actually don't know the, the initial set of cleaning steps that uh, Sami Gaiji took at GBIF. I do have the scripts if anybody wants to read through them. So GBIF at that moment held 234,000 records from Kenya. Okay? Um, I wanted to analyze one taxon because when you mix taxa, you get into a lot of heterogeneity. So birds are just under half of those 234,000 records. Okay? So that's clearly the, the taxon on which to focus. Now, Darwin Core fields include some quality control flags. And so there are flags for you know, known problem with ID, known problem with georeference, or just something's wrong in this record. So I eliminated just a few hundred records by checking to make sure there were no bad quality flags for any of those records. So it was like 350 <coughs> records. Pretty trivial loss there. So I'd like to think if GBIF is being a well-behaved data infrastructure and it's giving me data that are ready to roll, I'd like to think that those 106,000 records are now ready to, to stick into an analysis and start playing. But I'm kind, of, I'm kind of careful about these things. So let's do some data cleaning. So I looked at the Latin binomials, the species names. Okay, and there were 1,516 unique Latin binomials. And right away, that should be screaming at us because 1,500, 2,000 species is like the maximum you ever see in a country, even in Brazil, Peru, Colombia, which are the richest countries for birds on Earth. So right away, I'm thinking, okay, there's some garbage in there. Probably what I'm thinking is that it's misspellings and synonyms. That's the best guess. It actually was worse than that. So years and years and years ago, uh, a student and I took all of the major world taxonomies of birds and we lined them up against each other and we cross-linked them. It took us like two years. Never published it, never did anything with it, except use it in exercises like this. So I took three global authority lists and I compared those 1,516 names against those authority lists. The best match was with a book by Sibley and Monroe um, from the mid-1980s. A slightly newer book by Clements had a lower match. An older summary had a considerably lower match. So essentially, you know, Sibley and Monroe is, is a pretty bad authority list, but I think what it is is it's newer than the Moroni, Bach, and Ferrand list, which was based on our Peters list. This is, this is what taxonomists do, okay? Peters list began being published in the 1920s and ended publishing in the 1980s. And so Moroni, Moroni Bach and Ferrand, I think it was 76, 
took all that information and did a little updating and gave us at least a starting point. So this is kind of what we would call Peter's taxonomy, not Peterson taxonomy, Peter's taxonomy. Bird taxonomy is evolving very quickly. Um, Sibley and Monroe were kind of halfway between the old and the new. We currently recognize somewhere around 12,000 birds in the world. And what I've said on numerous occasions is that by the time I either retire or die, whichever comes first, um, ornithology will be recognizing 25,000 species of birds, which is to say bird taxonomy is horribly overlumped, horribly. So, oh, sorry, four global authority lists. There's that really old list, the Peters one. So a simple conclusion that I just used, I could probably improve on this quite a bit, but let's use Sibley and Monroe. That gets me 85% of those 1,500 names, okay? Now, what species are known from Kenya? I, w I found the Kenya checklist online. It's probably not the most authoritative. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Um, I, was, I was working quickly. Look at that. I have 1,500 binomials of which 85% were on the Sibley Monroe list, but only 1,100 species of birds are known to occur in the country. So, I had 1,295 matches with Sibley and Monroe, but that's a couple hundred more species of birds than are known to exist in the country. So now I'm really worried because I've got standard names. I had been thinking it was just a bunch of misspellings. But I've got 1,300 standard names and only 1,100 species, even if GBIF happened to have records for every single species that's known from Kenya. So I started comparing the Sibley and Monroe list to the Kenya list. Only 729 were held in common, which is to say GBIF held records for only 729 of the 1,100 records. Some things fishy in Denmark. Get it? <laughs> it was a bad joke. So here's the really scary thing. 566 records on the GBIF list that had names in Sibley and Monroe are not known from Kenya. So either we've got a lot of records that the Kenyans don't know about, which I doubt, or we've got some problems. So I started looking at what are those names, what are those species, and what I found was huge and horrible contamination. So Elenia albiceps was on the list. Elenia albiceps is a little gray-green flycatcher that's never been found outside of the New World tropics. So what I didn't do in this example is go in there and figure out how those records got confused and got attributed to Kenya. I just didn't have time. Whatever it is, we've got some garbage. And then there were 377 species that are known from Kenya, but weren't represented on, in the GBIF data. That's perfectly accept, expected. You know, not everything is digital, not everything is accessible. Some of those species might be known from a single specimen in the British Museum or something like that. And so, of course, it's not visible. So we've got some problems in the GBIF data. So next I looked at the family representation. And essentially this is of the species in a family, the species that are known from Kenya, what proportion of them are represented in the GBIF data. And this is the raw data set. And you see these families are right at 100%. So those were completely represented in the GBIF data. And then we have these families where most of their species, most of the Kenyan species, indeed were represented. And then we have 
this end of the distribution where poor representation. And so I looked at these families, and guess what? They're all aquatic and marine. No big surprise, okay? Marine birds tend to be poorly documented as far as their distributions, and there's no data set that's dealing with marine waters off the Kenyan coast. So essentially what I did was I went through the list of families and I got rid of all of the aquatic families, aquatic bird families. I'm left with this, and now what you see is that most of these families are pretty well represented by at least one record in the GBIF data, okay? A few families are pretty poorly known, but. So, now I've got my set of taxa, it was 700 something, right? But then I got rid of the aquatic birds, so now I'm down to 632 land bird species from Kenya that are in the GBIF data set. So right there, by whatever means, you know, if it were five records that were Elenia albiceps and, and, you know, taxa that are not even in Africa, I'm okay with that. But look at that. We lost 40,000 records. Now maybe they never referred to Kenya. If it's Elenia albiceps, they definitely never referred to Kenya. But those numbers, you know, that 400 million, is that really 300 or 200 million that are usable? So now I'm thinking, okay, I can use those 65,000 records for some analysis, right? I've been, I've been cleaning and cleaning and cleaning. I want to do some analysis. If I look by year, this is pretty much exactly what I expect. I see very few old records. In fact, this probably single record in 1800 is probably just somebody's way of saying a 19th century specimen, I don't know when. But, you know, okay, so we ramp up right around the turn of the 19th to 20th century. We see a dip around the World War and the Great Depression. We see things go up and down. That, there's no surprises there. Now let's look by season. Okay, so all I did was I took the records and plotted them out on a radial plot by month. And it looks to me like people really like to work in Kenya in July, okay? But we're still here, I mean, this is the 4,000 circle. Every month is represented by three or 4,000 uh, records. So we don't have any big, big, big gaps. Now let's start looking at geography. So now I need a georeference. So remember, I have 65,000 records after all of that filtering. Guess what? 27,000. So now I've lost three quarters of the data that ostensibly were from Kenya. So are those 400 million records 100 million? So let's look at this. So about 40,000 records didn't have land long reference to it. Yeah. Not geo 37,000, something like that. Yeah. Okay. So there. Is it possible to upload data on GBIF without knowing that audience? Yes. Yes. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So here are the locations of the sites where we have some data. And right away, you kind of see the message geographically, okay? But taking into account that you know, this point might represent 1,000 records and this point might represent one, I decided to fit a surface so that you can really see this better. So what I did was I tallied up the number of records, not the number of points, like there are two points in this square. I tallied up the number of data records of my 24,000 falling in each one of those blocks. 
and then I fit a surface. So now let's look at the gaps. In fact, for Kenya, the gaps are bigger than the coverage. It's basically coast, Nairobi, and, and across the southern, southwestern um, extent of the country, and everything east and north is basically unsampled. I assume these are lakes or, or parks or something. Lake yeah. But basically, two-thirds, three-quarters of the country, no data, even on birds. So that's kind of what Kenya looks like for birds. Now let's do something else. Let's look at the same data set, but with respect to environments. So again, I've got those 27,440 data points where they've been cleaned and they have, they have uh, latitude, longitude. And what I'm gonna do is use 10,000 random points across the country to characterize the environments. And I looked at the distribution of the sampling points and the random points with respect to annual mean temperature, annual precipitation, and elevation. And so these graphs are a little bit, a little bit deceiving, but essentially where there is a record, you see brown, and where there is not a record, but the climate combination is represented in Kenya, you see blue, which is underneath. So it's a little bit deceptive because some of these points, especially down here, it's awfully dense. And so this may cover a lot of sites. And this may be a million pixels across Kenya, and this may be one. Okay, so it's, it's a little hard to see. But sorry, that first one was precipitation versus temperature. And so what we're seeing is biggest gaps in low precipitation, high temperature, sounds like desert. Uh, precipitation versus elevation, we see maybe elevation is, is fairly uniformly covered, but these chunks are left out. And then if we look at elevation and temperature, Notice the, that's called the adiabatic lapse rate. It's the relationship between temperature and elevation. But you can see there are some low elevation, high temperature areas and things like that that are not at all well sampled. I can go in, identify those environments, and look at them on a map. And so these things in this light blue, those sites, are sites that are not only not represented geographically, but also represent climate combinations that haven't been sampled. So one thing is a site you know, out here somewhere that matches this site perfectly in terms of its climate. And another thing is a site out here that presents a climate or conditions that are completely distinct and is not sampled. So, that's an afternoon of work, okay? Um, I didn't do the nitty gritty details. I didn't have that army of 400 botanists across Brazil quality controlling the names and all that. But big gaps are out there, taxonomically, a, less, a lesser degree temporally, spatially, and environmentally. This is even for birds, okay? Even for birds, which are the best sampled taxon out there. And basically, I will bet any of you that if you do this sort of analysis for your country, you'll get the same result. The numbers will be different. But this is essentially what it looks like. Remember those digital accessible knowledge leaks that we talked about? Well, here's where they are. Um, 
this tiny little slice in the pie are the problems that GBIF detected or the problems that the provider detected. Non-standard names, we lose this chunk. Species that are attributed to Kenya but are not in Kenya, 